On Thursday in my personal devotions, I got this statement. And I thought, that's a good statement. And I'm going to try to work up a Bible lesson on that statement. Here's the statement. I didn't have Steve put it on the screen, but I want you to think with me. God's light shines the brightest through broken people. Now, let me give that to you again. God's light shines the brightest through broken people. I got a question. What makes you lose your patience the quickest? Well, I was in Walmart store the other day, and I must confess to you that I get impatient when they don't have enough cashiers at the checkout because I don't like using that no cashier thing. Here's another way that I get impatient, and that is trying to get out of a parking spot after a ball game. Or what about this one? We talked about this there the other night when I was at a meeting. When you are sick, and that's why you went to the emergency room, but instead of helping you quickly, they make you sit and wait. Well, I got good news for you this morning. One thing is very certain. Jesus said it. We'll put it on the screen for you. Here's the statement. In this world, in this world, you will have what? You will have troubles. In this world, you will have troubles. And yet, I want you to remember that God's light shines the brightest through broken people. Once we understand, here's another thought, put it on the screen for you. Once we understand that problems do have purpose, I think that we can better handle the trouble that comes our way. Now, my devotions on Thursday, I was reading out of the book of Romans, and so this is the text that I'm going to have for you. It's on the screen. Romans chapter 5, the first paragraph, the first five verses. Here's what it says. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace. What a wonderful thing. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith in to this grace in which, and I like the next phrase, we now stand. We now stand. And we rejoice in the hope and the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in what? In our sufferings. Let me use the word problems this morning in place of sufferings. We rejoice in our problems because we know that problems produce perseverance. And perseverance produces character. And then character gives us the necessary ingredient to face the problems. And that's the little word H-O-P-E spells hope. And hope, verse 5, and hope does not dis disappoint us. Because, I want you to see this, God has poured out, think about that, God has poured out his love into our hearts by his Holy Spirit. God has poured out his love into our hearts by his Holy Spirit. And when I was doing my devotions there on Thursday morning, I asked myself, how big a container is God pouring his love out of? 
Have you ever asked yourself that? How big of a container is God pouring out his love for you? Well, I want him to use the biggest container he can find in all of creation. Amen? Because that's the amount of love that I want to be the recipient of. And then it goes on to say, when he has given, whom he has given us, excuse me. So this thought came to me. What have you considered, we've been talking about seeing life through God's eyes, what have you considered as God's number one purpose in your life? Have you really thought about it? What is God's number one purpose for your life? Well, as I was there setting and doing my devotions Thursday morning, this is the thought that came to me, and I wrote it down. God's number one purpose in my life, God's number one purpose in your life is to make you like Jesus. To make you like his son. And if God is going to make me like Jesus, then I thought, he is going to have to put me through things like Jesus went through. Have you ever thought about that? There were five big things that Jesus had to go through that we have to go through if we're going to become like Jesus. And I don't have them in order, one, two, three, four, and five, but here's the ones that came to my mind Tuesday morning. Loneliness. Can you imagine the Son of God experience times of loneliness? What about fatigue? What about being tempted? What about being frustrated? And what about this one, being discouraged? You see, you and I are going to have to experience these big five that I call them if we're going to become like Jesus. Let me share with you, I think, two ways that God makes us like him. Two ways that God makes us like him. I'll put it on the screen. The first way that God makes us like Jesus is through the word of God. Through the word of God. John 17, 17, this is Jesus' great intercessory prayer. This is really the Lord's prayer, John chapter 17. And Jesus said these words, sanctify them, that's us, by the truth. Why? Your word is truth. God's word is truth. You see, we become like Jesus when we approach and understand and study the word of God. Here's another way that we become like Jesus. We become like Jesus through the way that life simply happens. Peter said these words, put it on the screen for you. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12, here's what Peter says. Dear friends, don't be surprised, don't be surprised at the fiery trials. I'm going to put the word problems there. You are going through as if something strange were happening to you. You see, my friends, if we are to survive, and that I think is our goal, the rigors of the problems we must face and overcome them and become like Jesus then there are some survival techniques that we must recognize if we're going to survive those big five. Okay? Let me suggest a couple of them. Put it on the screen. Here's the first one. Christian survivors know the owner of the island. Who owns the island? Who owns this? God. Russ mentioned that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. We've heard that said a hundred times, I'm sure. Well, let me take it one more step. He also owns the hills that those cattle are occupying. You see, no matter how dense the jungle, no matter how dense the problems, no matter how dense life is, the Lord is king of the jungle. 
And no matter what happens in this life to me, no matter what happens in this life to you, let me make this statement. Losing is not an option. Because God desires our survival. We're not losers. We're not hopeless. We're not fearful. Romans chapter 5, or chapter 8, says these words. You know them. I'll put them on the screen for you. Here's the form of a question. Who or what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sore? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep, as sheep to be slaughtered. And here's the answer to that question that Paul asked. No. In all these things that we have to endure in life, all the problems, we are more than conquerors. How? Through him. Through him. As survivors, we need to understand that we know the owner of the island. The island being this universe. It belongs to him. What's the second thing? As Christian survivors, we need to know the value of difficult times. Even hardship, even loneliness, even discouragement has value. Listen to what James said in James chapter 1 and verse 2. I put it on the screen for you. Here's what it says. Consider it a sheer, here's the word that caught my attention this week as I was preparing this lesson. Consider it a sheer gift, friends, when test, I'll put the word problems there, Consider it a sheer gift, friends, when problems and challenges come to you from all sides. Imagine what the outcome would be, my friends, if we considered our problems as gifts. I think if I considered my problems as gifts, certainly my outcome would be a lot different. So let me share with you seven facts that God gave me this week about problems. I'll put them on the screen for you in order. Number one, problems are not an elective in life. Problems are the required course. In college, you know, we had our primary classes, and then we got to take some elective classes. Those were classes that were considered, you know, not necessarily essential for your study, course of study, but, you know, they were sort of fun and kind of give you a diversion. Well, let me say to you, problems are not an elective in life. They are required, of course. Here's a second fact about problems. Problems are unpredictable. We don't plan at the beginning of a day to encounter an obstacle. They just, they just happen, right? Like driving down the highway and all of a sudden you hear this and air is coming out of your tire and the end result is what? A flat tire. Here's the third thing about problems. Problems will come in so many shapes, sizes, and forms that there's no way that you can ever be bored by them. What is my point? There's to, there is to be no boredom in facing the challenges to face the problems that God encounters for us. Well, I got some good news. Number four, problems are not permanent. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. Let me illustrate it this way. I found this one. I thought this would be good. 
for all of the golfers in the family. Three senior citizens were golfing together, and two of them were griping endlessly. Here's what they said. The fairways are too long, said one. The hills, they're too high, said the other. And the bunkers, why, they're just too deep, said the first one. Finally, the third man spoke up. Listen to what this third man said. At least we're on the right side of the grass. Mark Lowry, who is a Christian comedian who sings with the uh, Bill Gaither uh, group, he said one time, and I had this in my notes, that his favorite verse in Scripture was Luke chapter 2, put it on the screen, verse number 1, and here's what the Scripture says. And it came to, what's the word? Pass. It came to to pass. Now I want you to see what I said. If it came to pass, guess what is true? It didn't stay. What am I saying? Problems are not permanent. Problems are not permanent. Here's another one. Number five. Problems have a purpose. Problems purify our faith. Problems Purify our faith. Look at the screen. I want you to listen to James chapter 1. Here's what it says. You know, James writes, that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open. And your faith life shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. God's got a purpose for everything that we have to encounter. After all, we're trying. His number one goal is to make us like Jesus, okay? So let it do its work so that you become, here's the word, mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. Somebody described Christians. You know how they describe Christians? You ever heard this? I'll put it on the screen for you. Christians are like what kind of bags? Tea bags. What's true about tea bags? You don't know what's in them until you put them into hot water. Now think about that. When we think about the purpose of our problems. You see, my friends, our faith is developed when things do not go as planned. That's how our faith increases. Our faith is developed when we don't feel like doing right, but guess what? We do it anyway. That develops our faith. Here's another little story I found. I don't know if this is a true story or not, but it fit what I'm trying to say. A woman driver was having difficulty getting her automobile started after it had stalled in the traffic. The gentleman in the car behind her in, insisted in expressing his impatience with her by blowing his horn every few seconds. Finally, the lady, worn out by his thoughtfulness, stepped out of her automobile, the story said, and she walked back to the honker's car. And here's what she was overheard to have said to the honker. I'm having some difficulty in getting my car started, sir. If you'll go see... If you can get it started, I'll honk your horn. <laughs> Isn't it true? Problems purify our faith. Well, here's a sixth one. Put it on the screen. Problems produce perseverance. Problems produce perseverance. Here's what it says in that verse in Romans chapter 5 from the message translation. It says, we can rejoice in our problems because we know that our problems produce perseverance. That means, if I understand that correctly, that means that the problems you go through produces staying power. You see. And God teaches us patience in those traffic jams, in those 
Walmart lines that I started with, and even in those waiting rooms. Well, I said I had seven facts about problems. Here's the seventh one. Problems make me and you mature. Problems make you and me mature. The Bible says perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature. You see, problems in reality, if, if I can share it this way, I think is, is a powerful statement. Problems show us how grown up we are because problems reveal our values. And our values determine how we relate or evaluate, excuse me, the circumstances we find ourselves in, such as this. Put it on the screen. If we value comfort more than character, trials will upset us. If we value the material and the physical more than the spiritual, we won't be able to count our trials as all joy, as James says in his little writing. And here's the third one. If we value only the present and we forget about the future, the trials or the problems will make us bitter, not better. So here's a concluding thought. I'll have it on the screen for you. Life is not fair. Would you agree? Life is not fair. But what happens to you is not nearly as important as what happens in you. God wants you and me to learn something. I put it on the screen for you. Every storm, every problem is a school. Every storm, every trial, every problem is a teacher. Every experience is an education. And every difficulty, think about it, it's for our development. So I asked myself a question. Does God have a word for you, Jim, while you're going through your particular problem? Yeah, absolutely. God is saying to me, when you face your problem or problems, don't drift. Don't coast. Because you see, the problem with coasting is too often you find yourself sliding how? Downhill. So I put on the screen. Life is not a coast. Life is a challenge to be what? To be conquered. I read a story Tuesday afternoon in which the headline to the story, and I'm going to wrap this up, was this. I thank God for the fleas. Strange statement, is it not? I thank God for the fleas? Yeah. If you know anything about Corey Ten Boom, you know that the fleas kept the German soldiers out of Corey's barracks at the concentration camp in which she was confined. Because the Germans would not penetrate through the fleas, she could show God's love to the fellow prisoners in the midst of their awful, awful pain. So I thought, Jim, when you face a dead end, don't focus on what you can't do. Rather do this. 
focus on what God can do. Because I'll make one final statement and I'm through. Here it is. God specializes in the impossible. You know what we call those? Miracles. Miracles. So you want God to perform a miracle in your life? Lots of times I ask God for things not realizing what it really is I'm asking for. If I want God to perform a miracle in my life, in reality I'm asking him, hey, send me some problems. Because I can't solve the problems, but you can, God. And when you solve them, who gets the credit? God does. And who benefits? We do, because we become more like Jesus. Let's pray. Father, how thankful we are today that your light does shine the brightest when we're experiencing some of those big five. We thank you, Father, for the word of God we thank you for the peace and the contentment that it provides us as we attempt to understand it and then more importantly as we attempt to live by it thank you father for the fact that you take care of our fears in fact the Bible says that you have given us promises to overcome all of our fears. And by taking care of our fears, Father, you give us what it is that we need to continue to face the challenges in life, and that is hope, hope. Thank you for that. Father, today as we close our service in just a minute with the singing of a song, we want to say to all those that are here this morning, as humans, we do not know what's in one's heart. We don't know the trials. We don't know the problems. We don't know the circumstances of what it is that they are facing, but you know. And all you ask if we want to survive those things is that we will put our faith and our trust in you. If you never asked the Lord Jesus Christ to be your personal Lord and Savior, let me give you that opportunity this morning very simple thing all you have to do is first of all confess that you're a sinner and as a sinner you're in need of a savior because sin can't enter the portals of heaven and God has provided a wonderful savior in his son if you pray and ask him to come into your heart forgive you of your sins guess what he's a keeper of his word he'll do that very thing and then he'll send you he'll give you the gift of the Holy Spirit that will lead and direct and guide you for the remainder of your physical life. If that's your need today, pray that simple prayer asking Jesus to come into your heart and to save you. If you have some other issue that you're dealing with this morning, let me ask you, turn it over to God. Turn it over to God. Let Him do the impossible. We call that performing miracles. And we all love to hear and to see the results of the miracles of God. Thank you in ahead of time, Father, for the wonderful miracles that you are doing within our family and our fellowship. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray with thanksgiving.